Mesa. It was the ancient Khoi name for Cape Town, and it means the place of sweet waters. But by the 1860s, the wise elders of our city decided to put the water, the life force of our city, into the sewers beneath the streets and pump it out into the ocean, despite the fact that it's the very meaning of the city and the very reason that globalization happened, because people were able to come from east to west and west to east via this as a replenishing station. We have various problems facing us at the moment um, globally, and amongst the biggest being that of climate change, and there are many, many unknowns with regard to climate change. On the left-hand slide, you can see a beautiful piece of land art by Stradon von der Merwe, who's actually in the audience today. And uh, these are some of the things we don't know. We don't know whether we're going to be landing up in a state of drought or a state of flooding. It's both reality and possibility. You can also, there are some knowns, and one of them is that by 2013, Cape Town is no longer water secure. In other words, the population in the city is going to exceed the amount of water available to us. It's a very, very serious notion. We cannot live without water. I'm water, you're water. The one element that combines and unites us as human beings on the planet is the fact that we are water. On the left-hand side slide, you can see a study done by the city of Cape Town, which indicates various things that are going to be happening to the city. They looked at the city bowl, and the red, yellow, and dark blue indicate various sea surges and damage to property that's going to occur. And the light blue line there indicates 6.5 meters above sea level. That is what an estimate is um, telling us. Uh, it's going to occur over the next 50 years, and it depends which scientist you read this week. But over the next 50 years, that's where the sea is going to rise to. And I love the way everyone's panicking, because in fact, if you look at the right-hand side, slide, which is uh, one of the very first maps I drew of the city, you can see the yellow indicated there, which is the reclaimed land. So really, it's just Mother Nature reclaiming herself. There's a notion called hydrocide, which is basically when we, as a people, commit mass suicide as a result of our social misuse of our water resource. The city of Cape Town, once upon a time, had four rivers and 36 springs. All of these today have been diverted and rushed out into the ocean under the streets. Most people in the city of Cape Town are unaware of these waters, water resources. Um, of these 36 springs, you can see that little spring at the bottom in the middle of the slide is the Stutzfontein, which is, exists on Upper Orange Street on the mountain. It's producing currently 3.5 million liters of water per day. That is enough for every man, woman, and child in the city to have a liter each all wasted. And ironically, when FIFA built their fabulous sta um, stadium and needed to get some water to the stadium, they realized they were going to save themselves a fortune of money. So they um, tapped into this water and have utilized it very generously to flush the toilets. However, this water that came from this spring gave rise to the very first environmental law in this country, which is in 1655, Plakart 12, and it states very politely in Dutch. I prefer the vernacular, which is Munieni Vader Kakni. Fact. Um, Kamisa is one of many, many systems, and what I've um, developed over the last six years of research is a way to showcase a very small system that could have a very high impact because it would have global application. Our history of our country, our history of our various peoples of our nation is all embedded within this fabric of this water system. It is, however, only one system of many in Cape Town. We, for instance, have on the Cape Flats the Cape Flats Aquifer Unit, which is an underground lake. It's the largest in the southern hemisphere. It is currently so polluted we can barely use it to water our crops. Um, but Camisa has the potential to be able to recycle this water and to find ways to reunite us as a nation by showcasing not only the history of our city, but because Cape Town is the mother city, it's the frontier of our modern nation, and to be able to show this to people in a way that they can experience and be integrated within the system and understand how water operates or should be operating within the city space. Um, just to tell you all that water is a living cycle. There's no more water today than there was yesterday or in the time of the dinosaurs. 
Our planet is covered by 90% water, of which only 2% is potable. In other words, only 2% of the water on the planet we are able to drink. If we shit in the water, it's no longer drinkable. However, there are ways of saving water in that we are able to recycle it and utilize it for the benefit of all. And so the application of um, which I'm going to talk to you about in this, in this uh, little presentation has the ability to have a quantum level um, application globally because we're dealing with a river system that's running from mountain to ocean over a very small um, area, 6.7 kilometers, and it's passing from natural through um, suburban, urban, and industrial precincts. Uh, all the solutions are there for us to uncover and to be able to um, apply anywhere in the world to save any river system, whether it be big or small. So it has a very high impact. And we're able to prove an incredible theory developed by Dr. Tony Turton, which is that water is a flux. Um, one of the fantastic realities in this as well is that for every foreign tourist coming to South Africa, eight permanent jobs are created. This particular little socio-ecological link lies between the mountain and the ocean. The mountain is a potential World Heritage Site, so please on Thursdays vote for it, Table Mountain, as one of the new recognized seven wonders of the world. And at the other end of it is Robben Island, which is already recognized as a World Heritage Site. People are drawn to come to this place not only because of our political history. For myself, there's a very um, sort of private and uh, personal interest in, or the thing that kind of drives me behind this is that um, I believe in a, in a concept known as landscape cosmology, which comes out of Eastern philosophy, where God lives on the mountain and mankind lives at the ocean. And quite interestingly, throughout time, there have been various people who have mapped cities. One of the most remarkable of these being a gentleman by the name of Ian Mike Hogg, who was a biologist. And he had the students at the University of Penn um, collecting data and plotting maps. And he discovered all sorts of interesting things, like why he plotted people dying of cirrhosis of the liver, he plotted people dying of suicide, he plotted uh, infant mortality, all sorts of things. And he d discovered a number of things. And one of them that interests me is that the majority of people who commit suicide commit suicide if they live at the ocean. So it seems to be a healthier thing to be living on the mountain where God is. Anyway, when I uh, mapped the city through a series of maps, I discovered that the city has, not by coincidence, but has in some way got a natural chakra system. Um, so my solution for the city is this. It's called um, civic hydrology, and it is basically turning your backyard infrastructure into your everyday in infrastructure, so engaging your citizens to be living with the system. At the top of the slide, we have an example of Rome, which is a 2,800-year-old history of civic hydrology. In the bottom of the slide, we've got two pictures, a before and the after picture of Seoul City and Korea, where they hauled out the highway to reclaim their city space, and the reason that for their being was that river. The project was done in four years. Uh, it's a project about civic hydrology, so it's engaging the public in this process. It's been able to engage all those land parcels that are currently wasted and bringing them, um, people working there to bring the water back into the main system and linking the public spaces through that. Um, a little story that I do have to tell you, even though the red light is flashing at me, is one called the Rasvat. The Rasvat water hardly shouts, but there's an area on the mountain, because embedded in this um, story of Kamisa are a number of little social stories, or stories about our, our various cultures. And this one is about a washerwoman called Raf, um, Rifka, who lost her ring washing the laundry for the uh, masters up on the river. And her ring was a magic ring. It belonged to her husband, who was a Hafiz, who knew the Quran off by heart. And when he'd gone to have his hair shaved for a religious ceremony, they attempted to shave it. They were unable to. And the barber said to him, well, you must be wearing a charm. He said, well, I've got this ring on that my imam gave me. I'll take it off. He took the ring off, and they were able to shave his hair. So they discovered that the ring protected you from sharp objects. So Rivka would take the ring when she went up onto the mountain. The ring was lost. It's become an urban myth that has survived in our city. The descendants of the washerwoman walk every year on the 1st of December all the way up Bettencourt Street, up Gorge Road, to a site on the mountain where they reenact washing the clothes. They generally have a big party. And they believe that one day this ring will be found. However, the ring was found in 2006. The ring was dug up by an anthropologist and archaeologist who uh, discovered it 
amongst 34 boxes of artifacts that were dug up. So these stories do survive, and so do the artifacts. Uh, it's a gravity-fed dual water system. In case you don't know, Cape Town had electricity before the city of London. It was operated from the water that came off our mountain, 1895. We are able to uh, reclaim the spring water. We're able to recycle the water throughout the city to feed its uh, green spaces and to churn energy from it. We are able to churn from just five springs in one river enough energy to provide the lighting for the, all the city's um, street lights and public spaces. And then we have salt, uh, salt water up to the old, the old shoreline. This is just a, a series of maps that basically develop the, th the theory of how we can do this. And here you can see some of the things that we would be able to develop, the one being a sustainability park, various ways of treating water, where children come and play and engage with water. Uh, we are able to integrate infrastructure, so you can catch a boat in uh, Monwabisi, Kailiche, uh, Tableview, go all the way around, go all the way up to the old shoreline, which is where the Golden Acre exists today, by boat. And this is a picture looking at Cape Town, that's the road going through the middle there, um, across the slide, is Strand Street. Underneath Strand Street um, is Adley Street running up the slide, and that's where the... Um, underground grachts are underneath our city, the old waterways, and you can catch a boat. It's not an unusual idea. In Paris, you go to the new opera today by a boat. And um, the entire space between the buildings, which is 100 meters, is able to be utilized as public space. So you can go and enjoy a concert, a poetry reading, dinner, place for lovers to meet along the riverside. And that is one way of then mitigating some of the climate change issues of this seawater surges that are going to come up and be able to fill the underneath our city. By, able, by being able to reclaim these water resources, we're able to densify our city, which is a, a very important thing that we need to do to be living sustainably. So once we have a living city, or once we have living water back in our city, we have a living city again. Thank you.